Good morning, and welcome to today's mission status briefing. With us this morning, uh, Gary Horlocker, the STS-134 lead flight director, just coming off his Orbit 1 shift, and Heather Hinkle, the uh, principal investigator of STORM. And Gary, would you begin, please? Thank you. Well, uh, it's really great to be back here, folks. Um, as you know, the uh, mission continues to go very, very well. Endeavor is performing uh, nearly flawlessly, and uh, the crew are, are doing uh, incredibly well as, as well. So we're, the crew's about two hours away from hatch closure as we sit here talking today. Um, the goal of today, obviously, was to finish up all the internal work between the two vehicles. And I think Derek talked to you quite a bit yesterday about um, the maintenance on the station Cedra, the carbon dioxide removal system. So um, the crew spent a good chunk of the, the day yesterday working on, on that. They're taking out one of the beds that we're going to bring home on the, on the shuttle and, and then replace it with a new one and get it back installed and, and up and running. So um, things took a little bit longer than planned yesterday, so we finished that task up today and uh, everything is good there. We're also finishing up all the cargo transfer between uh, both vehicles. Obviously, all the cargo we hauled up to uh, give to station, we need to get on, on their side of the hatch, and then uh, all the items that they, they need us to bring home need to get back on the shuttle before they uh, close the hatches here shortly. We also completed the uh, last of the oxygen transfer from the shuttle to the station today, and um, we also managed to reboost the, the stack doing a shuttle reboost using shuttle propellant. Um, we got them about 1.8 foot per second, which is just over another mile an hour, and that increased their altitude by just under um, about 0.6 nautical miles, so leave them a little bit higher than uh, when we found them a week and a half ago. And then the crews also wrapped up some of the EVA activities in the uh, station airlock, getting it cleaned up and, and partially prepared for the uh, spacewalk on the following mission, um, SGS. Uh, 135 here in a month or so. The remainder of the day, of course, heading into hatch closure, the, uh, the crew's going to go ahead and bring the two spacesuits from the airlock on the station back to the shuttle. Those are the two that uh, uh, we used during several of the spacewalks. Drew wore one of them and um, Mike Fink wore the other, so we'll get those back to the orbiter in case we need them between hatch closure and landing. And uh, we'll also be packing double coal bags um, we do this pretty much every station flight right before hatch closure. We get uh, numerous science samples, get them in these cold bags, and, and get them across to the shuttle, and we bring them home for, uh, for analysis here on the ground. So once we get the, the hatches closed, the crew is going to go ahead and shift gears a little bit, focus in on uh, the undock tomorrow to get the rendezvous tools checkout complete, as well as get the centerline camera installed. And uh, that will put them in good shape for the uh, undock and, and fly around and storm activities uh, for tomorrow. So what I'd like to do is go ahead and, and walk you through a, a sh very short video about the undock and fly around and, and storm trajectory, if we can get that rolling. So the pilot, uh, Greg Johnson, will be flying the orbiter back to about 400 feet and then initiate the fly around. We'll do the standard full lap fly around. And then we'll do the SEP-1 burn. And that, that'll set us up on our way to the storm trajectory. We're going to be flying Above and behind the space station, we'll get about just inside 30,000 30, feet behind the, the space station. And uh, the storm sensors will be taking data all the way out to about 20,000 feet where they'll, they'll drop uh, lock. And then they'll be setting up for the uh, reacquisition here in just a minute. So we'll do another burn that'll bring us down below space station and uh, about 4,000 feet below. We'll do one more burn that'll put us on the, the storm required trajectory. And once we get that burn complete, we'll, we'll be coming into acquisition range of the storm sensors. They'll start taking data all the way in. We'll do a burn that'll bring us up towards station. We'll stall out around 1,000 feet below it, and then uh, slowly drift down and away and do a final set burn and uh, keep tracking the, the station all the way out till the sensors drop lock once again. So that's, that's what we've got in store for tomorrow. Um, I think at this point I'll hand it over to Heather to give you a lot more details on the storm activity. Thanks, Gary. So the storm team, uh, we, we're real excited to get to our primary mission um, activities. We are a sensor test that was uh, created under the Orion project, which Orion has now become a part of NASA's MPCV program. 
So what, what the sensors are, if the, if the camera could zoom over here for a moment, uh, we, we're flying a, a laser sensor and also a high definition camera. So the laser sensor has a, shoots a laser at 30 times per second, a flash LIDAR, and it gets a receipt off of any bright surfaces and reflectors that are up on the space station. That allows us to do range and bearing calculations to each of those reflectors or to station surfaces if you don't have any cooperative reflectors on board. The camera can be used, uh, we're assessing it as used for a possible backup as a star tracker, for centroiding off the station from uh, mid-range distances as a possible backup star tracker looking at stars, and then for close in um, piloting cues for the Orion pilots and astronauts. So those are the sensors that are out in the payload bay. And what they do is that uh, once they get on the docking axis, the uh, previous mission, these five reflective elements were put on board that reflect very brightly in the VNS wavelength, but are uh, essentially blind to the shuttle laser sensor so that there's no interference. And with visibility to these reflective elements, and I'll show some data here in a few minutes, uh, the storm sensors will allow you to be able to calculate six degree of freedom um, alignment and ranging and uh, velocity to your vehicle, which can be used for crude situational awareness, or you could close the loop around your flight control system and do automatic docking. So the storm sensors were operated during the rendezvous. Um, as Gary mentioned, from about 20,000 feet, uh, the laser locked on to the space station. And uh, we were hoping for, for that, and we got a little bit better than what we were hoping for um, out of the sensors. That was really exciting. So we're real, real, uh, looking forward to the re-rendezvous trajectory when we're on an Orion-type approach like Gary showed to prove again that we can exceed our expectations for that sensor. So if you could queue up slide one. Uh, this is sort of a picture of the docking camera on the left and then the range and intensity from the VNS image on the right. So what you can see is those three circles depict where three reflective uh, surfaces are. There, the whole space station is peppered with reflectors. Different vehicles have put them up there. The Europeans use reflectors. The shuttle TCS does, um, as well as the Japanese uh, vehicle when they approach. So you can see that it was able to pick up those reflectors. And then if you provide centroiding to those three, you now have very accurate information about where you are compared to the vehicle. Go to the next one, please. This goes a little bit further in, 600 and something feet. You can see now there's a little bit more spread in the reflectors. Next slide. This is getting real, uh, even closer. And you can see it's very locked on to those three. You can pick them out easily. Uh, as we get a little closer, next. 164 feet, you can see the camera is picking up a lot more detail. And now in your range and intensity, you'll be starting to see a lot more detail. Next. Uh, getting a little bit closer. I think the last one, if you could go to that, is, is a pretty neat one where you can really see how the VNS paints you a three-dimensional picture of what you're coming in by the intensity and the range maps you can see there on the right. So the five white, um, ref I guess the white circles that you see in the top right slide, those are these five reflective elements I just showed you on the docking target. And the real bright kind of bigger one that's a little bit above those, that's the shuttle's TCS reflector. So you can see that real brightly as well. And then the lower one in the range, you can see how powerful the information can be from this sensor and how you, you could use this for broader applications other than just rendezvous and docking. You could use this for imaging, for hazard avoidance, for performing landing, for uh, use for vehicle uh, uh, rendezvous and docking, of course, as well as things like deforestation. There's, there's just a very broad application of this technology. So that was my last uh, data slide. So we're really excited for the re-rendezvous, whether well, the sensors are ready to go, and uh, expect real good VNS data for the re-rendezvous. Is that it, Heather? Yeah. Great.
We'll start with questions here in Houston. Uh, please remember to identify yourself by name and organization, and please step to the mic to ask your questions. Yes. Philip Sloss with nasaspaceflight.com. For uh, Gary, on the uh, O2 transfer, um, was that, was that uh, airlock tanks and atm station atmosphere or one or the other? Um, yeah, the, um, what we wrapped up today was actually the um, internal atmosphere transfer. We, we, we took care of the, topped off the station tanks um, yesterday. And if you, I got the numbers here if you want them. We, we transferred about 17 pounds into the station tanks and, and they're all topped off. And so um, for the internal atmospheric transfer, we provided about 278 pounds of oxygen uh, for, from the shuttle tanks to the station. So, so that's what we got accomplished here in the last week and a half. Thanks, and, and uh, I'm not sure if this is for, for you or for Heather. Um, in the uh, undocking timeline and the re-rendezvous timeline that uh, the handout we got here, uh, it talks about the station going to the uh, DTO attitude after undock. Uh, is that just a minor difference between the, the undocking attitude, um, the normal undocking attitude? Thanks. Yeah, it's actually just a couple degrees pitched down, and, and uh, th that allows the, the storm sensors to acquire the uh, the key reflective targets on the really the Russian side of the vehicle as we're coming from behind and below, so they can get their initial acquisition um, accomplished. And I don't know if you had any more details on that. Yeah, Heather, we uh, we weren't really needing that kind of a special attitude hold until the the flight slipped into the time frame where the ATV was docked to the aft end, and it blocked off most of the reflectors that were back there, and of course not knowing. We hadn't proved this sensor in orbit yet. We wanted to give ourselves the best chance of having those reflectors pointing toward the shuttle as it came in so we'd have the best look angles to those reflectors. And uh, so station agreed to hold that, that attitude for us to increase our chances of, of getting that. And we have no doubts anymore based on what we saw for rendezvous. Okay, do we have other questions, Robert? Robert Perlman with CollectSpace.com. Um, I think for Gary, uh, first, uh, a couple of questions about things that were in the execute package today. Um, there was an area of interest, I guess, for the fly around on the ATV. Um, can you just describe what, what it is and why they need imagery of it? Um, yeah, I can touch on that. I don't know too many of the details, but uh, I know when they, when they um, initially launched and separated from their launch vehicle, they saw something a little bit off nominal, and uh, so they want to get some images of, of kind of the aft end of the vehicle where it was um, attached to the launch vehicle and see if they can get some, some kind of indication of that help them explain what they saw on launch day. So um, we're going to take about 10 minutes out of the 45 minute fly around and, and go ahead and focus in on that area and get a bunch of Im imagery for them. And then we'll, we'll go ahead and configure back and get the rest of our normal fly around photos. Thanks. And for Heather, um, there's also a note about the docking camera not being available to storm ops. Can you uh, share what, what impact that has, if any, on the uh, DTO? Sure, thanks. Uh, we, we had a, an issue with the data recorder that records the camera data uh, during some docked activities. We pulled data off our recorders, and we were seeing some strange behaviors during that time. So we added a checkout activity on flight day 13, and when we uh, were per trying to perform that activity, the data recorder would not complete its initialization. So at this point, uh, it looks likely that we won't be able to record any docking camera data on the undock and re-rendezvous. Uh, so that's a, that's a big disappointment to the SORN team. We're really fortunate that we got great data on rendezvous. We met about two-thirds of our objectives already. There were some lighting objectives that we, we uh, didn't get to see, uh, sun entering and exiting the field of view, and a few other of the harsh lighting conditions we were hoping to assess with the camera. Um, it, we have procedures prepared for Drew that if the recorder comes up nominally tomorrow, uh, he'll follow a different set of procedures than if it, if it does not initialize correctly tomorrow, then he'll have to go and run a couple of extra steps to power some things down for us. And in the um, larger sense of the full test, will that lack of, a, a lack of data mean that you need another qualification run to fully test out this system, or what, it, whatever you get will be sufficient? Whatever we get will be sufficient, and uh, 
the the re-rendezvous was most designed for the VNS to meet the VNS objectives. So we have our primary objective coming up at that long range on the um, re-rendezvous trajectory for the VNS. And it was another opportunity to try to expand the range of lighting conditions that we would see on orbit. That's one of those real tricky things to simulate on the ground with cameras. As much as you try to sun simulators and there's that harshness of the orbital shadowing and, and lighting conditions. Uh, we got to see a lot of those types of things during rendezvous. We saw some good sun glints and um, some of those other things. We saw a sunset uh, on the station that we, we got during rendezvous. Uh, so we, we were fortunate that we got as much as we did. And I think we'll, we feel we'll have been able to assess enough to feel that camera will be a good camera to use for Orion. And one last question for Gary. Uh, do you have transfer totals? Um, how much was moved uh, cargo-wise between shuttle and station? Um, I do not, but we can easily get those for you. OK, Denise? Denise Chow at space.com. A question for Heather. Um, for the, the um, storm sensors, other than the five reflectors that were put on the docking target from the last mission, is there anything else that would need to be added to the station um, for it to be used um, with the MPCV or Orion capsule? Uh, at this point, no. Uh, I think the, the fact that storm has proven that, that the sensor can lock on as uh, further than five kilometers out uh, allows them to have the good relative navigation information they need to target their burns for prox ops and approaching the station for docking. So that was, that was the biggest thing to prove out. There's no LIDAR sensors today that go anywhere near five kilometers. And so to have that proven out and to allow those models to go feed back into the MPCV project and to know that the surfaces are reflective enough as is at those ranges, that was, that was a big thing to go and prove. And then a question for Gary. Um, I was wondering if you could share some of your thoughts on um, Endeavour and docking for the final time. Thanks. Uh, sure. So um, obviously, you know, we've been focusing on this um, very long, very complex mission for a long time. And, um, you know, I think it's really going to hit home after uh, Endeavour sitting on the runway there, hopefully in Florida, in, in a couple days. Um, but. Uh, you know, she, she's really been a great ship. Like I said, almost performed flawlessly this flight. Really, the only couple of little issues we, we saw were really nits. And, uh, you know, just a real testament to the KSC team that prepares the vehicles that, uh, that we go off and, and execute these missions with. So, so it's going to be sad to see, see her retire, but uh, I can't think of a better mission for, for her to, to have her last flight with. So, Any additional questions here in Houston? Uh, seeing none, we'll move on to reporters on the phone bridge. Uh, Mark Caro. Yes, thanks, uh, Mark Caro for Aviation Week. And I, I have two questions. Uh, the first one is for uh, Gary Horlocker. I just wondered if the uh, reboost was part of the preparations for the uh, Soyuz 27S mission uh, coming up in June or some other uh, reason. Um, yeah, so, you know, the space station. You know, they've got vehicles coming and going on a regular basis, the progress ships for uh, the Soyuz vehicles, as well as shuttles and, um, you know, HTVs, et cetera. So, you know, stations got to look at this from a long-term perspective. So they're always looking at, you know, making sure the, the vehicles in front of them, especially the Soyuz, like you mentioned, um, are going to have the right conditions for their uh, re-entry and landing. That's key. So. Between ATV being there, um, I think they're going to be there about another month. And uh, with the orbiter there, they basically um, they already had a plan to to manage their their altitude to meet all everybody's requirements, and then uh, they were able to to go ahead and and accept a little bit of a reboost from us as well, and and still make everything work out down down the road. So, you know, it's it's just a constant thing you do with space station is. You, you, you continue to work your altitude and all your, your vehicles coming and going. So uh, really nothing unique here. It's just we, we were able to provide a little bit of propellant and a little bit of help to them. And uh, so it worked out really well. OK, thank you. Uh, and I had a question uh, for Heather Hankel. Uh, I've heard that the uh, storm uh, sensors that are being tested could be part of the uh, Osiris Rex mission, I think I said that right, that was announced last week, or the, the asteroid sample return mission. Uh, I just wondered if that was so, and if correct, 
how how the sensors might be used. Uh, well, I guess, thanks for the question. We actually have received some emails from that group during this mission asking, uh, how it, how's everything going? We're really looking forward to using uh, a sensor. We've chosen the VNS as our Proxop sensor for this mission, and we'd really like to hear about how things went and share some data with you, or if you could share some data with us. And uh, so we, we sort of said, everything's going great, and we, we love to meet with you, but you got to get wait till after the mission. We're, we're pretty busy with uh, all the preparing for all this. but. As you saw from the very last slide especially, if you went, would approach something that had no reflective elements on it for you, the VNS can paint you a complete three-dimensional picture of where you're going. So I think we will have a lot of really great data that we can hopefully find a way to do some great sharing with that project. And they can utilize that to help build some algorithms. We're also working with another Goddard group um, building another VNS and the same sort of purpose, which would be where you don't have any reflective surfaces that you've put on there in known locations, and you have to use that raw three-dimensional range and intensity image to do your, your ranging and uh, approach information with. And I, I might just, if I might follow on that, does that mean um, you're going to sort of look into the possibility of of using these sensors for that mission, or uh, that's to be determined way down the road? So I'm not sure I understood your question. You sure, I just want... JSC? The storm group? Yeah, I just wondered if the storm sensors were um, a possible part of that mission, or it's, uh, they will be used as part of that flight. Okay, so I, I understand. So the, the storm VNS sensor, is the particular one that, they're, that they have chosen to use for their mission. So I, I, uh, the STORM mission has sort of proven out in space the ability to track surfaces to provide this very high, highly accurate three-dimensional um, image of what you're approaching. And I think that they'll find that the data is going to be extremely useful for their mission. Thank you. Is that it, Mark? Yes, sir. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Stephen Clark? Hi. Thanks uh, for taking my call. Uh, can you, uh, one of you, refresh us on, on uh, which crew members play what roles on the Storm Rendezvous? Uh, do uh, uh, Box and Mark Kelly switch positions in terms of who's overseeing the piloting duties during that re rendezvous approach? Yeah. So, um, so Box will be on the controls once we open the hooks and start back in Endeavor away from the space station, he'll he'll be uh, controlling it, flying it back out on the V-bar till till he gets about 400 feet or so, and then he'll initiate the the fly around activity, and he will be in control of the vehicle for the whole fly around. Um, once step one is complete, um, Box and Mark are in a swap positions, and Mark will be flying the uh, the storm re rendezvous trajectory and doing all those burns. Oh, and I'm sorry, I guess. Uh, Obviously, Drew's going to be our uh, key guy on, on the storm laptop and, and all the storm procedures. He's our, he's our go-to guy for storm, so that's how that's going to play out. All right. Thank you. Uh, Bill Harwood? Uh, yeah, thanks. Two for, for Heather. You mentioned that uh, this has possible applications for deep space mission. Is this something that a commercial manned spacecraft provider could license or use? Yes, absolutely. This has very valid application for any space vehicle trying to perform uh, the function of, of rendezvous and docking, either with another vehicle or uh, trying to land it on a surface or to rendezvous into close proximity with something else that's out in space. Thanks. And then a, a standard reporter question, is there a cost that goes with this test today, the hardware and what it's cost to put it together? Yeah. the. The putting together the sensor sort of came from three different flavors. The Orion project, there's, there's always a set of non-recurring engineering costs to get your foundry set up to build your very high, um, highly technical detector that detects the laser light. Um, 
So there's that sort of underlying cost that's a one-time thing. Then the work to put the actual uh, unit together, test the unit and also the camera, that was paid for under Orion as well under a different contract. And then uh, Lockheed Martin actually purchased the VNS unit and is letting the government borrow it to fly on storm. And then it will go back to their ground facility in Denver uh, where they'll recreate the uh, about 200 feet in storm trajectory from rendezvous and uh, docking on the V-bar and use that to update models and to practice their uh, GNNC algorithms. So it, it, it's sort of a, a conglomeration of, of, of uh, costs. Well, no, I understand that. What, what, what number is there out there, however you want to characterize it? Uh, let's see. It's in the order of tens of millions by the time you add in all the non-recurring engineering. The unit itself is, um, was uh, less than $2 million, I believe, and then the, the cost to do all of the preparation of the unit, the, tech, the uh, qualification testing for environmentals, certifying it to fly on the shuttle, that was under $10 million. Okay, thanks. Okay, I believe we know how. We have no further questions uh, on the transfer uh, question. We we don't have a number from late today. Earlier in the crew day, it was about 82 percent complete, and we expect uh, some fresher numbers uh, in a tag up uh, a little bit later today. That will uh, conclude today's briefing. Uh, you can follow activities of Endeavor and the International Space Station at www.nasa. Dot gov. Thank you for coming.